Facebook also? No, sir. YouTube. YouTube only. Okay. We can do that, but again. Yeah. Now I think the time is up. Yeah. So one more minute. One more minute. Uh, so, sir, your watch is. Uh, I mean, late. I think. Yeah, yeah. Now it's three. Now yeah, it's three. Thank you, thank you, sir. So please <laughs> connect to YouTube. Yes, yeah, connected. Oh, yeah. okay. It's connected. Thank you. So, uh, very good evening, all the participants. Uh, we will start our uh, silent prayer now for 15 seconds. back i'll i'll now invite uh, pallavi ma'am to uh, do the welcome address pallavi ma'am please thank you shri san sir greetings to all and a warm welcome to yet another powerful webinar by ceir it's my honor indeed to welcome our resource person for today dr kp mohanan former faculty at the university of texas and National University of Singapore. I welcome Ms. Tara Mohanan and Ms. Aditi Ahuja, also resource persons for today. It's my privilege to welcome our members of the Board of Directors, Zonal Directors of CEIR, Premium Members, Principals and Teachers. Center for Educational Initiatives and Research, CEIR, is a forum of experts and scholars who aim at nourishing the talents of educators to raise the education sector in India to global standards. CEIR has an efficient board of directors, zonal directors, and premier members all across India and the Middle East. It's indeed wonderful to know and commendable that since 2009, CEIR has conducted 11 principals conclaves, 16 interactive se sessions with CBSE officials, 63 Saturday webinars, 26 handwriting made easy workshops, and seven career counseling sessions so far. The national level NEP quiz conducted by CEIR saw the participation of around 5,000 educators and the NEP masterclass webinar series and NEP pedagogy series that were conducted were a successful venture of CEIR to bring the new education policy and its practical impl implementation to the classroom. In fact, it's a proud moment for all of us to know that all the CEIR activities are supported by Veda Handwriting Lab. I encourage you all to visit 
vedahandwritingkit.com to know more about Veda Handwriting Lab. Here, I'd like to inform you all about the upcoming projects of CEIR. Our next Saturday session is on 3rd of July. For the ongoing 21st century teaching strategies series, the next session is on 29th June on the topic collaborative learning. I request all the participants to post their questions in the chat box as they listen to the speaker so that we don't miss out on any of our queries. And I'd like now to introduce our versatile speaker for the day, Dr. K.P. Mohanan, who did his PhD in linguistics from MIT and has taught at the University of Texas at Austin, MIT, Stanford University, and the University of Singapore. He has made significant contributions to linguistic theory. He co-designed with Tara Mohanan an inquiry-oriented undergraduate program in linguistics at the National University of Singapore and has worked extensively with the nature of academic knowledge and inquiry against the backdrop of human beliefs. He joined the II SER Pune faculty in 2011, where he continued his work till he retired at the end of 2016. He is the co-founder of ThinkQ. ThinkQ stands for thinking, inquiring, and questioning. ThinkQ seeks to empower learners to think, inquire, and question like mathematicians, scientists, philosophers, and historians and function like truly educated individuals. It also enables them to understand, change, and enhance the world around them. Sir, it is indeed our privilege to have you with us here today. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to address so many people who are interested in education. Um, but before I begin, a couple of things. One, uh, this, what you see, uh, the PowerPoint slides on the screen, you can download this. If you look at the chat, you will see the, uh, the address for downloading. So please download and you can look back and forth if you want and scribble things on it. And your questions can be based on if you want to refresh your memory, go back and check those things. You can also print it out. Print it out. Uh, the other, this is going to be a kind of interactive session. So every now and then I might stop and uh, ask for questions, not at the very end, but also in the middle. So for that purpose, it might be useful to type your questions in the chat beforehand so that we can select your questions and then proceed. But in the final Q&A session, you can use either the chat box or just ask, raise your hand and ask questions. So both options are available at the end. But in between, I think it might be useful to, if you want, you can start typing your questions as uh, you proceed. And some of us will read out your questions in between. All right. So let's begin. Uh, next, shall we go to the next slide? Okay, here is a plan of action. I will begin with a couple of examples. Then I will Use, using those examples, I will outline the idea of rational temper, which is an expansion of uh, scientific temper. And then I will unpack the higher order cognitive abilities that NEP 2020 mentions. Not that, not that these abilities are mentioned in detail, but I'll unpack them. And in part four, we'll discuss three more examples and then sum up. Okay, and in between there'll be some time for questions, short, uh, short questions for clarification. Okay, next slide. Let's begin with an example. Okay, this example has to do with the issue of invisibility of mushrooms. You might be surprised why, uh, you know, the, the title, about the title. It's because a few years ago, a teacher, a school teacher, seventh grade, I think, contacted me and said, this is what happened to her. Uh, a student contacted her and told her that in the textbook, 
uh, it says that microorganisms, so let's, uh, microorganisms are organisms that are invisible to the naked eye. The, I'm pretty sure you have learned this in your primary school or your secondary school. Then the textbook also says that fungi are microorganisms. And then it says in the same chapter, it says that mushrooms are fungi. And the student said, uh, that means that mushrooms are invisible to the naked eye, right? If microorganisms are, can, are invisible and fungi are microorganisms and mushrooms are fungi, then it must be the case that mushrooms are invisible. But the student said, well, I can see mushrooms. Now, this uh, created a lot of problem for the teacher. She didn't know how to answer the question, right? Because uh, we can see mushrooms. And so there is a logical contradiction between the textbook, between the conclusions that we derive from the textbook and our own experience. That was a teacher's problem and she didn't quite know how to solve it. That's why she contacted me. There is actually uh, an interesting solution. Okay, let's go to the solution. This is the problem in logic, problem of logical contradiction. Okay, and the solution can be along the following lines. Okay. There are two types of fungi, unicellular fungi and multicellular, they fluctuate between these two. The unicellular fungi are not visible to the naked eye, single cell fungi, but the, and these are microorganisms, but multicellular aggregates of fungi are visible because you, have, you must have seen fungi on food, for example, white fungi on food or dark fungi on damp walls. These are actually visible, but these are not single cells. These are aggregates of cells. And mushrooms are multicellular. Okay, they are the, uh, let's not go into the details. They are multicellular, that's why they are visible. So the textbook should have said the following thing. Unicellular fungi are microorganisms. That is not contradicted by anything in our experience. So the logical problem is solved by making that mode. Okay, now, what did we learn from this small activity? Okay, the following things. Let me list those things because they're going to be useful for understanding higher order cognition that NEP 2020 wants us to focus on. The, number one, logic is a powerful tool in critical reading, reading of the textbook. Number two, two powerful concepts in logic. Okay, logic reasoning. Logic is a study of reasoning. Logical contradiction, that is to say, if a statement says X is true, another says X is not true, like the earth is flat and the earth is not flat, that's a logical contradiction. One statement negates the other. Logical consequence is a consequence or a conclusion derived from a set of premises, okay? And logical contradictions are bad, okay? Logical contradictions are a problem to be solved. They are. If there is a logical contradiction, the statements are false, at least one of the statements. Lesson four, to resolve the problem, we have to reject or modify at least one of the contradictory statements. That's how you solve a logical contradiction. And that's what we did. Remember the textbook says something and there's a logical contradiction with our experience. And we changed the textbook statement by saying it applies only to unicellular organisms, unicellular fungi. Okay, now here is, a, here is the most important thing. Statements in textbooks can occasionally be wrong. And therefore, we need a critical eye when reading, especially textbooks. We cannot accept everything in a textbook. We have to be very careful. We have to apply critical thinking when we read textbooks. This is an example of the need to apply critical thinking when we read anything whether it is textbooks or uh, magazine articles or research, doesn't matter, okay? This is the most important part of this, the lesson of this invisibility of mushroom example. Let's take another example, okay? Uh, we all know that ancient stages, ancient sages tell us that water and air are elements and gold is not element. This was the case in ancient uh, Greek and ancient Indian uh, philosophy. Let's pay attention to the word element, right? 
Textbooks tell us that, the modern chemistry textbooks. Gold is an element, uh, water is a compound, and air is a mixture. So the statements in modern chemistry textbooks of you know, physical sciences, they contradict what the ancients tell us. That's a problem, all right? How do we resolve the problem? All right? Because one says water and air are elements and the other says water and air are not elements, obvious logical contradiction. Okay. Uh, the two positions are logically contradictory. We have to solve them. The question is, what should we reject? Should we reject ancient wisdom or should we reject modern wisdom and why? Okay, what's the reason for rejecting either the ancient wisdom or the modern wisdom? We are in serious difficulty. How do we resolve that problem? Okay, how do we solve the problem of logical contradiction? Right? I'm not going to work through all the details this time, but I'll give you a clue and you will have to do the solution yourself. The clue is this, okay? We have to need, we need to clarify concepts. We might think there is a logical contradiction, but maybe there isn't. The question is, does the Sanskrit form Bhuta in Pancha Bhuta denote the same concept as element in modern chemistry? Okay, the Pancha Bhuta theory that says that uh, Agni is a Bhuta, uh, Bhumi is a Bhuta, is translated, these are translated as air and water and so on, and the Bhuta is translated as element, but do they denote the same concept? If you ask that question, I think you can resolve the apparent logical contradiction. If Bhuta and element do not den denote the same concept, then is there a logical contradiction? Right, that's a clue, okay? And to, to, this is just halfway to a solution. It's not a full solution. You'll have to figure out what the word Bhuta means in Sanskrit. And you can do that on your own by doing some web search. Okay, now let's pause and uh, see if there are clarificatory questions on any of the things that we have covered. We, we are happy to answer questions. Are there any questions? Uh, Madhavan, sir. Uh, like logical contradiction and a rejection of one statement and validation of another statement uh, is all right. But the thing is, nowadays, this 21st century students, they are logically diverting from here and there. So my point is, or our point is, how to enhance that logical consistency how to make those students logically consistent because giving them clue, giving them answer, rejecting one form and accepting another one is easy, but that is not a permanent solution. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the, making the students logically consistent, what sort of practices we should do or we should have in our <laughs> curriculum or in our lesson planning? Yeah, that's an excellent question. In fact, the whole purpose of this uh, webinar is precisely that. Yeah. Right now, our school curriculum doesn't have any provision for reasoning. So if the school curriculum is designed in such a way that one of the important strands is reasoning and the study of reasoning logic, and we have st strengthened their reasoning capacity, logical thinking capacity through that course, and how that can be done is a separate issue. But the answer is that if the curriculum contains one of the components is logic, just as one of the components of curriculum is mathematics and the foundations of mathematics is logic, but logic is missing. So if you begin, let's say sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth and 10th grade, have we spend about at least half an hour a week over these four years. By the time they complete their 10th grade education, they'll be powerful to detect logical contradictions anywhere, not only in textbooks, but also elsewhere in, in newspaper articles and in their research, which is crucial. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Are there any questions in the chat box? No, sir. There's nothing in the chat box. Okay. <laughs> All clear. Right. Yeah. All clear, sir. All right. So we'll proceed. We'll give, you know, there will be another occasion to ask questions, but and the final, uh, after the webinar, there'll be more occasion. All right.
let's go to the next uh, set of things. Part two is, as I said, the notion rational temper, okay? Rational temper is a generalization of what is called the scientific temper and the scientific temper is a concept in our Indian constitution. You must have seen this, Article 51A, H, or something like that. And it requires every citizen to have scientific temper. This is a, this is a requirement from the Indian constitution. Okay, I don't know if uh, lots of people are aware of it. Now, what the, the concept of rational temper does is to generalize it to not only the science, but also mathematics, science and philosophy, or mathematical inquiry, scientific inquiry, and philosophical inquiry. So what does that mean? What do we mean by the rational temper? Okay, these are the ingredients of rational temper. One is the acceptance of logical consequences. We have already seen what a logical consequence is. If you have a set of premises, then we must accept their conclusions. That's what it means. Uh, the conclusions from a set of premises is the lo logical consequence of the premises. Okay. That's one. Number two, prohibition of logical contradictions. If two propositions are logically contradictory, we cannot accept both. These are actually the central pillars of rationality. Okay? These cannot be violated if you are in rational inquiry and subjects like mathematics, science, philosophy, history, all of these are rational forms of rational inquiry. So these ought to be the foundation of education. Number three, this is not enough, okay? Guardedness in accepting conclusions unless supported by adequate reasons. So if somebody says that the earth revolves around the sun, we must say, okay, what, is the, what are the reasons for believing that? That is the guardedness in accepting conclusions. If it is a conclusion, we must ask for reasons. This is like saying, if somebody tells you, gives you a mathematical theorem, you must ask for and check the proof, okay? Next, uh, open my, combined with that guardedness is open-mindedness in accepting conclusions supported by good reasons. If there are good reasons, then we must accept them and it might require us to change our existing beliefs. So both that combination is an important ingredient of rational temper. We must be ready to change what we believe if there are good reasons. Number four, uh, so this is, this is self-correction. Okay. Number four, um, a sense of uncertainty and fallibility of one's own and other people's beliefs. What I believe may turn out to be wrong and what other people tell me also may turn out to be wrong. So that's uncertainty and fallibility of human knowledge. There is nothing in human knowledge that is completely certain and this applies to norms and values as well. And if we have that sense of uncertainty and fallibility, we must be willing to doubt and question the positions that are taken for granted, our own positions and those of our peers, as well as those that we regard as our authorities. And this includes, the authorities include parents, other elders, teachers, experts, leaders, and textbooks. We are going to focus on textbooks as the authority, as an example of authority. When we say doubt and question, that does not mean we reject it. It simply means that we must be careful and we must ask for reasons, that's all. It doesn't mean that we reject everything. That's very important. We must doubt what we ourselves believe. That's a very difficult, difficult state of affairs. It requires several years to get into that mindset of believing, doubting what we believe or believing what we doubt. Okay. That's the rational temper, right? Um, now on the basis of that, what, what I said about rational temper and the examples that we uh, discussed, we can now unpack what NEP 2020 says about higher order cognitive abilities. This is what NEP 2020 says on page four. This is just one piece. There are other places where they talk about higher order cognition. Education policy lays particular emphasis on the development of the creative potential of each individual. It is based on the principle that education must develop not only co cognitive capacities, but the foundational capacities of literacy and numeracy and higher order cognitive capacities, 
such as critical thinking and problem solving. Uh, let me stop there. Crit critical thinking and problem solving is what we illustrated with the first two examples of the invisibility of mushrooms uh, and the ancient and modern wisdom. Okay, those are the two examples. We went through the details of the examples to show what it means to say problem solving and critical thinking. One kind of problem solving, not all kinds of problem solving. This, uh, the example that I gave was that of problem solving of knowledge, not practical problem solving, such as, for example, what do we do if there, if there is a leaking, you know, if there's a leaking tap, that's a different kind of problem. Or what do we do uh, to, to solve the problem of hunger? That's also a different kind of problem. Okay, so let's, uh, let's unpack higher order cognitive abilities. One of them is independent learning of higher order. One, that is to say that students must have the capacity to learn from documented sources of knowledge, say for example, from internet, without having to depend on teachers or educational institutions. Once you complete your education, let us say you're 30 years old and your degree was in, let us say, biology and you want to learn something about Indonesian history. Do you have to take a course? No, you don't have to. You can find out something about Indonesian history simply by reading. You, you have completed your course, let us say, in mathematics and you want to learn something about analytic philosophy. Do you have to take a course? No. Lots of uh, resources are available. You can learn on your own. So independent learning ability is a hallmark of an, indiv of an educated individual. This is one of the higher order abilities, higher order cognitive abilities. Next, <clears throat> independent inquiry. It is not enough to learn from documented sources of knowledge. You must also be able to construct your own knowledge on the basis of available information, including data we have gathered and our own thinking. So independent inquiry is a, is a basic entry to research. Research is specialized form of inquiry. Whereas when we say inquiry, what that means is the ability to answer your own questions on the basis of your own thinking. So call it uh, research level zero and research is advanced stuff. That's, that's one way of thinking about it. Okay, next, critical thinking. What does that mean? Well, we all say the word critical thinking, but what exactly is it? Okay, critical thinking is evaluating the credibility, that is whether I should believe it or not, the credibility or believability of our own and other people's beliefs, information, opinions, knowledge, okay? We should be able to evaluate that credibility ourselves. That's one of the important aspects of critical thinking. Number two, we should also be able to evaluate the usefulness, effectiveness, and efficiency of products, processes, and practices. So if somebody tries to sell us something, it's a product, we should be able to critically evaluate the usefulness of the product, effectiveness of the product, efficiency of the product, and so on. If there is, for example, a, a, a prestigious educational institution that offers a program, we should be able to evaluate its value on our own. Okay. If we are going to get married to somebody, we should be able to evaluate the worth of that person on your own. If you're going to vote for somebody, we should be evaluate the, uh, the, the, the credibility of that person, the ethical sense of that person and so on, on our own, and decide for ourselves whether we should vote for that person or not. All these are important, important aspects of critical thinking. Okay, number uh, next. Uh, and not only usefulness, effectiveness, and efficiency of products, process, and practices, the most important part is ethicality of actions and processes. Okay, so for example, if there is a law that says uh, let's say uh, euthanasia, euthanasia is mercy killing. Should we have a law that permits euthanasia? Okay, an educated person should be able to think of it on their own and write an article newspaper either supporting euthanasia or saying euthanasia should not be allowed. That is the ethicality of actions and practices. Okay, all these come under critical thinking. Critical thinking, in other words, is not simply criticizing somebody, all right? Or being critical of something, that means you're rejecting it, okay? You should also be able to critically evaluate the beauty of works of art. 
if somebody says that Coleridge is a greater poet than Wordsworth, or somebody says that Rembrandt is a great artist, instead of blindly accepting it, you should be able to look at the work of art and decide for yourself, do I judge that work of art to be a great work of art? That is the aesthetic critical thinking. So there are different categories of critical thinking. All right. And th this is what, this is how we ought to unpack higher order cognitive abilities, independent learning, critical thinking, independent inquiry, and so on. Okay. All right. Now we are going to focus on critical thinking by focusing on critical reading because critical reading is a specific case of critical thinking, thinking critically about what we read. And what we have done so far is a special case of critical reading, namely critical reading of textbooks. And we should teach our students how to read their textbooks critically. This is the very first step, okay? And this is what I was illustrating in the first two examples, how to read textbooks critically. Okay. Uh, and if you want details of higher order cognitive abilities, I went through this fairly fast. Uh, you can look at uh, the article, Higher Education in India, Vision, Purpose, Policy, and Strategy. This is given in your uh, the, the, the PDF file that you have already downloaded or the PDF file that you should download. Okay. All right. Next. Questions. Are there any questions that somebody would like to ask or questions that, that uh, have been typed? Sorry, there are some questions um, in the chat box. Uh -huh. So um, shall we go ahead yeah, yeah. with those? Let's take okay. the questions now, yeah. First one, why have you mentioned only eighth to 10th standard curriculum? Um, uh -huh. uh, and need a time slot for logical thinking can't it be used in primary standards? Ah, um, that is partly because if you ask me, uh, the, the primary school critical thinking would be of a different kind, not the kind of critical thinking that we have mentioned. You are absolutely right in saying that critical thinking should be developed in primary school as well. In fact, critical thinking should be developed even before that absolutely. in kindergarten and at home. So when a child is three years old, the parents should nurture critical thinking. But I focused on the secondary school because the examples that I'm going to discuss are of that type. They're not meant for primary school. For that, those uh, uh, developing primary school critical thinking, there is a program called Philosophy for Children. Okay, uh, and if you are interested, I can give you uh, references to. In fact, you can do a YouTube search on philosophy for children. You will see lots and lots of videos on that. But the examples that I have in this particular webinar are restricted to the secondary school or the undergraduate level, slightly higher level. Primary school critical thinking is different in nature. The pedagogy is different in other words, but you're right. Yes, absolutely. Critical thinking should continue from kindergarten all the way to PhD and postdoc and later too, yeah. Um, okay, one more question. I think that's related to this. Um, it is a sense of uncertainty and fallibility of one's own and other people's beliefs. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this work for the different sections of school, pre-primary, primary, middle and senior? Because this is very abstract for younger children. How do we address that? Yeah, we, I don't think we should lecture to children about uh, uncertainty and fallibility. Uh, what, <laughs> again, the questions seem to be primary school and I, I am not actually, I haven't taught primary school children. So I don't have any experience of doing that. I can only guess, I should say. My experience has been, actually my experience has been at the PhD level to undergraduate level. Even secondary school is not all that easy for me, but I have done that. So the uh, way to deal with that is to take children's position seriously instead of dismissing them, discussing what they believe and pointing to possible reasons for why their positions could turn out to be wrong. And children can figure that out if you simply ask them questions about what about such and such. We have done, with, done this with our uh, grandchildren 
without mentioning words like fallibility and uncertainty and so on, but simply engaging in discussions with them. For example, even engaging in stories with them in such a way that our questions and points make them change their minds. So if children realize that their position can be changed, and if they realize that adults' positions can be changed, for example, a parent telling the child, oh, you are right, I was wrong. That is a fantastic boost to children, okay? Both the children being wrong and the parents being wrong, they gradually imbibe the sense of uncertainty and the need to carefully examine things without the technical words through, through actual practice, through exemplification. That's the best solution. I hope that that makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, perhaps one more, depending on how much time you have right now. Okay. Um, how do we relate what you talked about, uh, critical, sorry, um, how to develop these higher order cognitive abilities as first we have to do it with teachers? Yes. Um, if the question is how can teachers develop uh, these higher order cognitive abilities, I think my uh, advice would be to go to our website, the Think website. And I think uh, the Think website is given on top of the uh, uh, handout, the PDF file that you have. We have lots and lots of videos. So for example, look at the event section. There are lots of webinars on it, on the events website. And we also have at the very first page, uh, articles and PDF files and videos, huge wealth of literature. Go through those things and learn uh, some of these abilities. Uh, you can also uh, take a course on inquiry and, inquiry and integration uh, that we run every year. And then we'll guide you to, you, you know, the uh, other ways of getting there. That's a, that's a very brief answer. Okay. Shall we? You want to go on or take more questions? If there is some Im important question, then we'll do that and then proceed. Yeah. I think probably. Um, take you them decide up which later. questions take. I don't know. Take, take, I don't know them, the from, take them up later. Okay. okay. Yeah. So next. Okay. We go through some more examples. Maybe the questions will become clear when we go through those examples. All right. Example three. Now, this is going to create some angst, but don't worry. Okay. This is the Angelson theorem that everybody is familiar with. We learned this in, in secondary school. And the theorem says that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. All right. Everybody knows that. Okay. Let's take a look at it very carefully. Okay. So, first point. If AB is a straight line segment and point D is on AB as it, as it is shown in the diagram, all right, then what happens? The textbook says ADB is a straight angle. Everybody remember that? There, there are these definitions of uh, right angle, straight angle, obtuse angle, acute angle. You don't have to remember all that stuff. All that you need to remember is the definition of straight angle, okay? And straight angle is 180 degrees. So the angle here in angle ADB is 180 degrees, okay? Next, let's, let's show the that, that, that angle there shown is 180 degrees, all right? Okay, now we, also to, we are also told that triangle is made of three straight line segments as in this diagram, okay? You have A, B, C, and there are three angles, and the sum of those angles is 180 degrees. But now let's consider this. Uh, the sum of angles is in a triangle is 180 degrees. So those are the three angles. Now let's put the two things together, okay? How many points are there in a straight line? If you have a straight line segment A, B, and if there is a point D, then that is, that is already 180. How many points? infinitely many. So look at that diagram. How many angles are there? D is already 180, right? It's a straight angle. And then there is angle A, angle C, angle B. Some, is that 180 or 270? That's a logical contradiction. All right? So what would happen 
if a student came to you and asked you, but isn't there a straight angle, a number of straight angles on every straight line segment? How can the sum of angles be 180 degrees? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't the correct answer be infinite or infinitely many? Okay, that's the problem of logic, of logical contradiction. Okay, I've given the worked out uh, question, if AB is a straight line segment with point D on AB, angle ADB is a straight angle. Next, by one, I'm giving you the proof that this is more than 180 degrees. By one, the uh, assumption that we made earlier, there are infinitely many points on AB and hence infinitely many straight angles on AB. And hence, uh, we know, we know that a straight angle is 180 degrees and the triangle is made of three straight line segments and by two and three, the earlier assumptions that we made, the sum of angles is not 180 degrees. Okay, so there's a logical contradiction between one part of the textbook and another part of the textbook. Right, the logical contradiction is the textbook says that the sum of angles is 180 degrees and the sum of angles is not 180 degrees. All right? Okay, this is, uh, this is not going to be an easy problem, but we'll give you a, uh, uh, give you a clue uh, next. Okay, um, before, before we give you a clue, what we did was unpack the logical consequence. In the previous uh, uh, slide, we unpacked the logical consequences. The next one, this one. Okay, we deduced the logical consequence, the statements, that is the proof. And it was the proof that gave us the result that there are infinitely many angles, infinitely, it is not 180 degrees, that is one. The second part of critical thinking is we detected logical contradictions between two sets of statements. Next. And we refuse to accept both together. Okay, if there's a logical contradiction, we cannot accept both. So we have to accept either the angle sum theorem, okay, uh, or we have to reject either the angle sum theorem or at least one of the statements in one to three. So we could reject, for example, the notion that. Uh, there is an angle on a straight line. We should reject the idea of a uh, straight angle. That, that will solve the problem. Okay. There are other ways of solving the problem. And that will be using the notion vertex and defining that notion carefully. I'm not, I will not go into the details at this point, but it can be solved. It's all, all that I'm going to say at this point. This is partly to uh, create some angst in you so that you will think about it when you are falling asleep today or when you're riding a bicycle or taking a shower and so on. And that's when real learning happens, okay? This is not, uh, uh, creating that angst in you is not pure sadism, but a way of triggering further inquiry in your mind. Okay, let's now go to the next example. And this is classical mechanics. I'm going to do the same thing, mind you. I'm not going to do a lot of great deal of physics, but something that you already know. Okay, you remember this formula F is equal to M multiplied by A, force is mass multiplied by acceleration. Okay, this is what every person who has done, you know, 10th grade physics knows. Next, now imagine two balls on the floor. Ball A is stationary, ball B is moving with constant velocity and it collides with ball A. So there is this ball moving and this ball is stationary, this ball comes and collides. Okay, now, the, remember, this ball that is moving is constant velocity. So given that ball B is moving at constant velocity, its acceleration is zero, All right? Now, if you look at number one, F is equal to MA, if A is zero, what is MA? Zero. So what is force? Zero. So if the force, with which this is colliding with it is zero. How can this thing move that? The prediction will be that this ball will not move. But how can that be? 
our experience tells us if a ball is moving and hitting another ball, this both balls will, you know, this ball will continue, move, will start moving. So our experience seems to be in conflict with the equation that we learned in school. Okay. Our experience tells us that what the textbook says is wrong. I'm not saying what the textbook says is wrong. I presented the problem in a certain way that it might be a little confusing. I cheated you, but you have to figure out how I cheated you. And to figure that out, you have to understand what that equation means, F is equal to MA. And that may not be all that straightforward at this point. If you have learned to calculate results by using these equations and you have not fully understood F is equal to MA, then you will be in anguish, but that will force you to understand what that equation actually means. All right? Okay, next. Uh, another example, who is a terrorist? This is something that we have done with uh, secondary school students. Okay. What is the definition of terrorism? The definition of terrorism is the use of fear or terror to achieve our goals. So we discussed terrorism in a secondary school classroom. I think it was class eight. And then we asked them to give us examples of uh, terrorists. If this is the definition of terrorism, can you mention some of the terrorists? And you know what they said? They said, parents and school teachers use fear to make children do what they want them to do. Therefore, parents and school teachers are terrorists. This is what the eighth grade children said. Okay, now we intuitively feel there is a difference. It is true that parents and teachers use fear to achieve, certain, for example, fear of punishment. In fact, the examination system is a terrorist system under this definition. Students learn in order to, because they are afraid that they might do badly. Otherwise, they're not going to learn anything, right? So examination system by this definition is a terrorist system. And the penal court system, it, if you do something wrong, you'll be imprisoned, you'll be punished. And because of that fear, you don't do certain things. So you, you obey traffic laws because you are afraid that you'll be fined. All these things by this definition are terrorist systems. But you feel there is something wrong that we don't call it terrorism. So if your judgment is it is not, these are not examples of terrorism. Well, there is a logical contradiction. Okay. If you believe that parents and teachers are not, by and large, they are not terrorists, even though they do sometimes engage in punishments, then there is a logical contradiction between that belief and the definition. That means that you have to have a different definition of terrorism. What would that definition be? Inquiry begins in, in when you are starting the search for that alternative definition. I'm not going to give you the definition, but the, the moment you try to resolve the logical contradiction, you have to look for a different definition. That's where inquiry begins. Investigation of the concept of terrorism on your own. You can't look it up, you know, uh, in, in the internet. You will have to de define it, def come up with a definition on your own. Okay. Now let's sum up, okay? So what are the things that we did in, in this uh, session? One, on the basis of some examples, we characterize the concept of rational temper as one of the important ingredients of higher order cognition, right? And this means accepting logical consequences, prohibiting logical contradictions, developing a sense of uncertainty and fallibility, habit of doubting and questioning, and requiring adequate reasons for accepting conclusions, All right? And these ingredients are central, not only to critical reading, which is what we used for, but also critical thinking, and also for inquiry and research. We gave you examples of independent inquiry, some of the problems resulting in independent inquiry and research and independent learning all of these. So that was the gist of what we tried to do, all right? And if you wish to implement NEP 2020's recommendations of higher order cognition, it is crucial that we build these elements. This was actually the very first question that was raised. How do we help students acquire these abilities? Obviously we have to 
these elements should be built into the curriculum. Right now, these, they are not. And so children are helpless. So that's our recommendation to implement NEP 2020 higher order cognition. These elements must be built into the curriculum. They must be part of the textbook. They must be part of the teaching. They must be part of the timetable. We must dedicate at least one hour a week to develop some of these abilities. And for that, teachers must acquire some of these abilities. It's a, it's a complicated problem, but we can do it. Okay. So now we can go for more questions. Um, open floor. Uh, yes, sir. Morning, sir. Uh, that example force is equal to mass into acceleration. Uh -huh. uh, you have logically cheated us, no doubt. <laughs> because it depends. The, at the base of that uh, equation is the force is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum. And when a body is moving with uniform velocity, there is no change of momentum. So force has to be zero that way also. Yeah. <laughs> so like Absolutely. that. Yeah. So if yeah. you know that thing is revealed, but yes, with that definition, the students will understand very nicely the concept of change in momentum. Yeah. Also, yeah. they have to interpret that F is equal to MA equation. They yes. have, to have a conceptual understanding of that equation. Yes. It is not enough to calculate using that equation. If they understand the concept that the, the equation is trying to express, yeah. they will immediately say, your interpretation is wrong. That is not how you should interpret it. Yes, yes. Definitely. I'm not going to say what that interpretation is. Yeah, yeah. And similarly, the you know, near about even the NCRT textbook also mentioned that thing, Newton's third law. Every action has equal and opposite reaction, but they don't mention that action and reaction are two different bodies. So. Yeah. Uh, Yes, definitely. And if we understood that thing and if we reveal those facts to the students, they will be logically consistent. So I got partially answers of myself of my first question yeah. that how to develop that technique. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, can we, uh, there were some questions that uh, came up earlier on the chat before we uh, go there to- There are people who, are, who have been apparently raising their hands or something. Yeah. So uh, how do we how do you choose between chat questions and raising hands questions? We had said chat questions get priority, right? During okay. the session, we had said. Uh, okay. During the session, those those have priority, obviously. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. um, well, the first question. I'm sorry, I didn't give the names of the persons asking the questions earlier when we had the session. Now, Gauri Sarkar says, "How is analysis different from critical thinking?" Analysis different from. Critical thinking. Oh, uh, the, the word analysis has multiple meanings. One standard meaning is breaking up things. So for example, chemical analysis is, you know, identifying the different parts of a molecule or substance. Uh, the literary analysis is identifying the parts of a poem or novel and so on and looking at it. Uh, so that is the standard meaning of analysis, breaking up things. Sentence analysis, breaking up the parts of a sentence and looking at each part. And in this sense, analysis is the opposite of synthesis when putting things together. So breaking up and putting together, these are two things. But there are uh, other meanings of analysis, but these are probably the most, you know, most common meanings. Uh, analysis is necessary for critical thinking, but that is not sufficient. It is one of the components of critical thinking. So conceptual analysis is breaking up the parts of the meaning of a concept, the parts of a concept, which is what we did, you know, in some of the examples. Right. All right. One more question, one last one. Uh, and this uh, actually two or three other questions about language also um, will probably get answered from this. It says, why is only mathematics and science subjects related to critical thinking? Why not languages as a subject are not related to the same? Uh, till now, all developments in terms of methodology are only done in math and science. Why are languages ignored in the system? Yeah, that's not entirely right because we also dis discussed uh, terrorism, right? Um, we could discuss other questions like what is justice? Uh, and there are philosophical issues, for example, what is free will is a philosophical issue. All these are indeed part of critical thinking inquiry and so on. But we have to, in a 40 minute presentation, we have to choose certain things. So we picked one example from mathematics and a couple of examples from science and one example from 
the social sciences, terrorism. We could pick examples from democracy. What is democracy? Or we could pick examples like what's a nation? Uh, all these are possible. So uh, we could raise questions like, was Panini an Indian? If you raise that question, all of you will be in total anguish. Panini is one of the early linguists of the Indian subcontinent. And the reason why uh, we didn't pick uh, language was, uh, I am a theoretical linguist. So I don't want to talk about my own subject. I want to talk about other people's subjects. We, but we could do the same thing with linguistics. Yes. Okay, I guess uh, over to the, uh, the raised hands and so on. So somebody should, uh, somebody should point. Dr. Mohanan, uh, can I take a few more questions from the chat box? Uh, which, sure, sure. Uh, you know, uh, there is a question uh, by Madam Philomena who says, is it uh, critical thinking the same as critical pedagogy? No. No comments on that. No, 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 it is not. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm not going to discuss that. All I can say is that it is not the same thing. The word critical appears in various contexts. For example, literary criticism, critical reading has nothing to do with critical thinking. So the word critical, he was being critical of her. That is not critical thinking. So there are other meanings for the word critical. A literary critic is not necessarily somebody who exercises critical thinking. That's a different context completely. Okay. Very, very true, yeah. sir. Uh, so one more question that I think uh, this was in my mind too. Shamita Ahuja wants to know, open-minded inquiry from high school students is often disregarded, criticized by authorities as insolent behavior. So how can this issue be addressed? And sir, I think this is very pertinent. This came to yes. my mind when we say, you know, our willingness to doubt and question the position taken for granted even by authorities. Uh, yeah. How should we encourage children to get into yeah. this? Uh, this? This is an extremely important practical question that we have struggled with. Uh, so in, in the undergraduate program that we designed, we encourage students to question and doubt us. So to, to tell you an actual concrete example, in the undergraduate program that we designed in the second year, Tara was uh, discussing some question. All the students were around her, some faculty members, all of them were crowded near the whiteboard. And Tara gave an argument to, to, uh, to prove something. And one of the students turned to Tara and said, but Tara, that's a lame argument. A second year undergraduate student telling a person with a PhD in linguistics from Stanford University, a professor in NUS, a student says, Tara, that's a lame argument. And you should have seen Tara's face. She beamed and she came back and said, now I know that I'm teaching them something valuable. Okay, that's a very different attitude. Not all teachers like that. In fact, our students also got a bad reputation for exactly what you said, insolent behavior, troublemakers. So we told our students, look, don't do this with every teacher, okay? You may think critically, but you don't have to express it because sometimes if you express dissent, if you tell your teacher, I disagree with you, the teacher might get angry, in which case, keep that to yourself. There is also the pragmatic aspect, okay? Teachers cannot control your mind. They can only control your behavior. And pragmatically, you should know when to express your disagreement and when not to express it. So if there is a, if there is a person pointing a gun at you and do at 12 o'clock noon and saying, is it day or is it night? You have to know what that person wants. And if that person wants you to say it is night, tell the person it is night. What's the big deal? Okay, that, the difference between uh, thinking and doing, you have to understand the difference. Very true, sir, very true. Yeah. Uh, and just related to this, there's another question by Brinda Ghosh who says, the onus is on the teachers to be able to question everything. The curriculum designed and the examination questions. Uh, how does one even think that this will change? Um, the onus is not necessarily only on the teachers. The onus is on all of us. Parents, teachers, principals, administrators, uh, the curriculum designers, textbook writers, the ministry, all of the entire 
country as a whole, in fact, the entire world. Notice that teachers themselves are part of this, this exactly this kind of training. So you can't, you can't pin, you know, point fingers at teachers and say, you are bad people. No, they're not. Okay, we have to empower, whoever is capable of doing that, we have to empower the teachers. Now, that is not sufficient. Empowering teachers would not be sufficient if the administration is against that. If the administration says, your job is to make sure the teacher, students get marks. Obviously, teachers cannot go against the wishes of the administration. Even if the administration is willing and the management is willing, if the uh, examination system says what is important is giving the correct answer, correct answer means whatever the examiner decides is the correct answer. Okay. Then you have, you have to train students to do both. You have to make a distinction between training students to do well in examinations, which means giving the examiners what they want and being educated. So what we would recommend is a dual curriculum. If a school is willing, if the management administration and the teacher of a school are willing, they can institute two curricula side by side, one for examination and the other one for education. And you can decide what percentage of time you can allocate. So at this point, we would say something like, if you can allocate two hours a week from class one to class 10, that'll be more than enough. The rest of the time you can train students to do exams. Okay, but the difficulty is that, you know, the, our society is not willing to do that. We are so bent on examination training that even those two hours they think is a waste of time, which is very sad. I agree, sir. I agree. I totally agree. It's very disheartening. Uh, you know, let's hope we, <laughs> we are <laughs> motivated. Uh, so keeping in line with the questions, there is uh, a question by Bibhuti Biswal who says, uh, who wants to know critical reading and critical thinking. Which one comes first for the students? Critical reading is a way of nurturing critical thinking. So you don't have to ask which one comes first. If they're capable of reading, at some point they are capable of reading on their own. So we give them critical reading exercises. But critical thinking, if it can be done even with students who are not, who have not learned to read and comprehend yet. So five-year-olds can, you know, it, it'll be, uh, if five-year-olds have not learned to read yet, critical reading may not work. So whatever works with students, you do that. You don't have to say which comes first. Okay, <laughs> sir, I hope uh, I can go on and on because there are some questions. Yes, in that we, yeah, yeah. We, yes, sir. I have to, I have to leave around 10 p.m., that's all. <laughs> we let you go before that, sir. <laughs> yeah, Mohan, sir, uh, with your permission, there is a philosophical court in India. It's an ancient court from Bhagavad Gita. It says, uh, you know, you have to critically analyze and decide upon. So uh, I think uh, that sometimes works. <laughs> Please continue. Man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, Shrisan, so well said. Uh, there's a question by Ibrahim who says, how do we balance between the children's need for stability with doubting and questioning via critical thinking? Sorry, could you read that again? Yeah. How do we balance between the children's need for stability and doubting and questioning via critical thinking? The ability, uh, you mean... So so can I just, can I just, I do, I, I'm not sure I understand no, no. the question. Can I, I just, can I just repeat that question? Hmm. It is balancing the children's need for stability on the one hand ah. and doubting and questioning via critical thinking on the other. Ah, okay. Stability means ah. some certain certainty of belief. Yes. yes. So, uh, yes. So this is where it is important to say, I can, I can doubt what I believe. You believe something with considerable certainty and yet you leave open a window of doubt. So take, for example, the, my belief that the earth revolves around the sun. There is considerable evidence for that belief. But am I completely certain? No. If you want to assign a number, I could say I am 99% certain that this is true. But if somebody asked me, are you completely certain? I would say no. Anything that I believe can be certain and can be, turn out to be false. But if I take something like the statement that 
all organisms, all existing species came from a single uh, ancestral species. The evidence is not that strong as in the case of the earth going revol revolving around sun, but there is still considerable evidence. So if you want to assign some kind of number, I would say, well, I'm about 80% certain, 80% is just a random number, just to illustrate the difference. Okay. I'm less certain than the earth going around the sun, but that also is open to doubt. So there are degrees of doubt and degrees of certainty. And there are some cases where I simply do not know. No, okay. What is important is to understand the difference between uh, those different degrees of doubt and degrees okay. of certainty. Sorry, can I? Stability means given two options, yes and no, I choose yes on the basis of evidence or reasoning. That is stability, but that is that still coexists. That comes out of practice. The, the capacity to doubt what you believe takes a lot of time. I would say something for children, it might take about a couple of years. It's a very difficult, you know, balancing act, but it is possible. Yeah. I think, uh, sorry, Pallavi uh, uh, ma'am, I think uh, our AP Sharma sir want to ask some question. I saw his hand raising. Sharma sir. Yeah, he's raising the hand. Yes, yeah. yes. Sharma sir, uh, please. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, wonderful, very interesting talk. Uh, I was, uh, I got disconnected, so I was not in the coast, but uh, very interesting talk. My question is that uh, right now the problem is not critical thinking. Problem is thinking. Children of secondary school are not having thinking ability and then they can reflect and they can really critically think. Yeah. So how to, how to develop that thinking process because they want to cram anything. Yeah. So that's why I suggested separating the two curricula, the curriculum for doing well in exams and the curriculum for education. If you, if you devote at least two hours a week from class one to class 10, we can help our children develop thinking capacity, thinking, imagining. Uh, there are various aspects of mind, imagination, insight, intuition, creativity, logic, rigor, a whole bunch of things. We, we just picked one small strand, but if you have a curriculum that aims at education, including, for example, ethical sensitivity, ethical ability, aesthetic ability. So all these two, all these uh, things which are ignored in our education can be done if you, if you devote at least two hours a week for education. Uh, Dr. Monan, again, nowadays, it's a current trend that every lesson plan to explain any concept in the secondary or senior secondary schools, they do take the success criteria. Now, to make that lesson plan again logically consistent whether we should take the success criteria because those success criteria will differ from concept to concept and even from student to student mm -hmm. and there by taking the success criteria in other way we are killing the instinct of critical thinking or yeah. their uh, possibility of doubts yeah so what is your input on that well that that will continue we can't change that system that's an age-old system and it is very difficult for any, any particular group like us to change that. So we should be asking the question, okay, given that this system of examination is going to continue, can we do something? Can we make some difference? And the answer is yes. So focus on what we can do. Let's not focus on what we cannot do. No matter what the system is, we can still implement some difference. Even if it's a single teacher in one classroom, that teacher can make a difference. Say so spend about 10 minutes in one week, ignore everything else. And the rest of the stuff can be examination coaching. Yeah. Right. So if you focus attention on figuring out, if you focus, figure out what it is that we can do to educate our children and devote some time to do that, leaving the rest intact, gradually I think the system will break. Yeah. Maybe in 30 years, our children will change the system. Very correct. Very that we correct. Yeah. Right now, we cannot change it, but they should change it when they acquire positions of power to change. They will remember what they learned in school. Yeah. And they will say, this system won't work. We have to change it. So that's what we have to work for. Tara, did you want to say something? Sorry. No, that's OK. Uh, there are some more interesting questions. So I wasn't sure if uh, Pallavi is going to ask those questions. Pallavi, ma'am, uh, let yes, us go to the question and answer session then. Yeah. Pallavi, ma'am, can, yes, can we go to the question and answer mode now? 
Yes, yes, sir. We are ready. Okay, okay, okay. Done, done, done. Taraman, would you like me to take on the questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. I just saw so, a few interesting. Yeah, ones. I know. <laughs> uh, Praveen okay. S wants to know how can we improve the critical thinking among the teachers. <laughs> oh, I answered that question already. Yeah. yeah. Go to our website, the Think website. And there are two sections there. One is the events section, which has lots and lots of webinars, videos of webinars. And the other is on the, on the main uh, uh, homepage. There is a link to all the materials that we have produced. There are PDF files and videos, but you know, of all kinds, for undergraduate students, for researchers, for primary school students, not primary school, I think that much, secondary school students. Primary school, we are still working on it. Actually, there's a question. Um, this is from Babita, but it's something, it's a question that I think a lot of people have in different forms. Uh, it says, will not too much of critical thinking take away the joy of living? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good one. And, and, and that the next question is also, you know, uh, yeah. is there a downside to critical right. thinking? So I think... I think <laughs> okay. Uh, this is like asking... If you are a thinker, will that take away your ethics? Will that take away your sense of beauty? I, I, as a high school student, what I wanted to do was become a painter. And I went to a school of art for three years and then decided to, you know, well, as circumstances did not allow me to do painting. But my painting ability is not, or painting appreciation is not threatened by my intellectual abilities. My ethical ability is not threatened by my intellectual abilities. They, in fact, reinforce each other. So the, you know, if you have intellectual abilities, ethical abilities, aesthetic abilities, pragmatic abilities, they're not in conflict. This is like saying, uh, if, you, if you eat only carbohydrate, right? Then of course your, your uh, diet is unbalanced. The same way, if that is all that you're doing, then of course your mental diet is unbalanced. So if you study only mathematics and nothing else, if you don't do philosophy, if you don't do biology, your diet is unbalanced. So put all these things together, you're okay. So there is nothing like too much critical thinking. So one of the questions that, that I ask, which not many people are interested in, is an important question in today's physics, namely, is time a reality or is that an illusion of the mind? No, people would think this is a crazy question but some of the best physicists in the world are thinking about it. And they have different opinions. There are some physicists saying, oh, no, no, time is real. And others saying, no, time is unreal. Okay, I'm extremely interested in that question. Is that doing any damage to my question? Is that doing any damage to my, let's say, cooking? No. When I feel like cooking, I go to the kitchen and cook. And while I'm cooking, sometimes I might be thinking about reality of time. There is no conflict. Okay, when I paint my uh, intellectual Consider, uh, preoccupations don't distract me. Yeah, and after a lot, so many years, people now understood time is the fourth coordinate, at least, along with yeah, X, Y, Z. That is what is being questioned now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, one more very interesting question. I mean, uh, Shashi Ram Ramanajan wants to know in the, you know, in the very beginning, that's before the implementation of NEP 2020. Students who were brought up without critical thinking in their primary standards. Now, what are the challenges for the teacher to inculcate critical thinking in them? Well, the answer is the same. The teacher has to develop critical thinking abilities, inquiry abilities, and so on. And then use whatever materials are available, resources are available to put that into practice in the classroom or outside the classroom. So if the teacher wants to help students to learn critically, the teacher has to learn. So if a teacher wants to learn ballet, the first thing to do is for the teacher to learn ballet. If the teacher wants to teach students painting, you have to learn painting. That's, that's as simple as that. If the teacher wants to teach neuroscience, you have to learn neuroscience. So the important thing is to realize that teach in the teacher's own education, maybe some of these things were missing. For example, you haven't learned neuroscience, in which case, learn it. You haven't learned ballet. All right, go ahead and learn it. That's it. It's very simple. Of course, you have to figure out how to do that. There are certain things for, you know, uh, like 
that that could be difficult but most of these things are available for you know resources are available yeah. um there's an uh, there's an important comment come question here uh says uh, this is from Ibrahim. Ara, have... I think I think. Can you show your face because people will have a greater trust in a human <laughs> face than octopus. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> oh, I Christ. will try. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So this is you have left many questions unanswered to trigger critical thinking, but this is not done by teachers in the classes. Many times they end up telling every fact and opinion. Is yeah. that one key impediment? <laughs> yes, it is an impediment. Uh, so quite often you have to decide which questions from students we should not answer and which questions we should answer. And that is not an easy thing to, 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 uh, to decide. Quite often, my experience in ISA, for example, ISA students ask me all kinds of questions. And occasionally I try to pause and then say, let me, let me see if I should answer that question or let you figure out the answer. And you know, and the, my students laugh first. Say, if you know the answer, how come you're not telling me? I tell them, look, if I give you the answer, I'm robbing you of an opportunity to think. There are also occasions when a student asks a question, I blurt out the answer, what the answer that I think is correct. And I say, oh, oh I should not have said that. Uh, sometimes it is not easy to decide, but if you have that in your mind, if you can help the student answer the question on their own without giving away the answer, that's the best policy. But some questions, that may not be possible. Right? You may have to help a little bit, but help only when help is needed. If the student can figure out the answer with some struggle, let them struggle. That struggle is valuable. Really true, sir. Uh, so one more question uh, from the chat box again. If we remove the examination system, then do you think critical uh, thinking will be enhanced? So uh, Singh wants to. It will be, it'll be much easier, uh, but not necessarily so. For example, when I was a school student, examinations were not that much of a you know, fear. So I never bothered to study for the examination. I barely scraped through. Uh, I, I just spent time on other kinds of things. And when I was an undergraduate student, I cut all my classes and went to the library and learned stuff. And I was, I think I was about to fail because I hadn't studied anything. I was cutting classes and learning other kinds of things. One of my friends forced me to teach him and because I felt obliged to teach him, I, I, I thought I should learn and I learned in order to teach him. That was why I passed, otherwise I would have failed. But the good thing about the system that I had was nobody forced me to learn what I didn't want to learn. It was examinations were not that much of a bugbear. I didn't have any homework, I, you know, I wasn't drilled. So you know, it was a kind of inefficient system. Didn't teach me anything, but at least it didn't destroy me. I find that the education system has systematically become extremely efficient in drilling students and destroying the potentials of students. So given the choice between an extremely efficient, dangerous system and completely inefficient system, I will go for the inefficient system. The kind of system that I had when I was like 50, 55 years old. Yeah, 55 years ago, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you will learn. It only means, the system will not act as an impediment to valuable learning. That is not sufficient. You have to have a good system that nurtures thinking abilities. Uh, so one more question from the chat box. Uh, Anju Chaudhary wants to know what major changes should be introduced in the curriculum that will help us inculcate critical thinking in children. Well, who is going to design the curriculum in the, the school or NCRT or some higher up? If it's a school, then you, you can have, you have to decide how much time you're going to allocate. And if, if you have that time, if you are a school administrator, principal or part of the management, then talk to us, we'll help you. But if you are a teacher and the management or principal is not uh, you know, sympathetic, then you can't afford to spend two hours a week. 
then you have to have a different strategy. So it depends upon who you are, what your capacity is, what your power is. Are you a teacher? Are you a parent? Are you a principal? Are you part of the management? It, the answer varies. It depends upon what exists within your power. Very uh, interestingly, sir, Anuradha has... Uh, there is somebody who has raised the hand. Bin okay. Bindu. Bindu, ma'am, want to ask some question, I believe. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Bindu, ma'am, please go ahead. I think we should unmute her. Yes, yes. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, sir. It was an exact, a wonderful session. And, and I have two questions to ask. One question is, uh, is there anything like left side and right side of the brain that affect the critical thinking and creative thinking? That is one question. Is there any logic in that? Another question which I would like to ask, this, these days we, we can, we'll often say that our children, they have very worse uh, executive function of the brain uh, because they spend more time on the screen and they don't have, I mean, they have lack uh, social connections also. So do you agree with that? These are the two questions. I don't know how to answer that question. If you ask me, do I agree? There is some, some truth in that, but one has to be very careful in saying what it is. Uh, to begin with, the, the division between the left and the right brain is somewhat oversimplified. There are different parts of the brain that are responsible for different functions. So for example, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for decision-making and certain aspects of critical thinking. But that by itself is not going to do it because the limbic system is, works in, in tandem in, with, in cohort with that system. So relevance, for example, comes from the limbic system, the, the, you know, the middle part, of the, center, the core part of the brain. Occipital part is important. The temporal lobe is important. These different parts of the brain contribute, they work together to, to, uh, to engage in critical thinking. So to say, to develop only one part of the brain, that's not going to work. So the, the, the answer that I'm going to give you is something like this. No neuron is really intelligent, but you put together all the neurons in the human brain, you get intelligence. That also applies to regions of the brain. If you just have the neocortex, that brain is not going to be intelligent. If you just have the limbic system, that brain is not going to be intelligent. If you just have the occipital region or the temporal lobe, that brain is not going to be intelligent. You need all of them. It's like saying it's like your human body or the you know, different parts of the system. You need your hands, you need your legs, you need your head. That's what it is. But you have to exercise. You have to exercise all parts of your body, and which I don't do, of course, uh, but, and all parts of your mind. So uh, that uh, less uh, uh, social connections and uh, more screen time, uh, do you think that will affect? Uh, the yes, yes. In fact, uh, I find that my students, undergraduate students, have very little ability to read because they prefer to watch videos. Watching videos is a good thing. There are all kinds of things that you can learn. For example, there is a course on, uh, on classical mechanics by uh, an ex-MIT professor. It's a fantastic course. You can learn from the MIT professor if you watch those videos on YouTube. It's a good thing to do. But if that is all that you do, you will not be able to read Einstein and Feld's book, Evolution of Physics. And if you have lost that capacity to read Einstein and Feld's book, which, is, which, is, uh, which doesn't have a single equation, then you're losing out. Okay? So you must have both. A one-sidedness is a problem. And there are people who... who can learn only from videos, not even from audio podcasts. They're missing out on something. There are people who can learn only if they are in the classroom with a teacher. They're losing out. So develop all these, all these channels of learning. That's important. Don't restrict yourself to one of those. Thank you so much. Suresh, sir, want to ask some questions? Dr. Suresh, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, uh, sir, actually speaking, the, uh, neither the uh, teachers nor the principals have uh, labor, I mean, are not uh, setting the curriculum or uh, the syllabus. But uh, I, I can say that the teachers have got the liberty to adjust the syllabus in such a way that if we want to inculcate uh, critical thinking and all, as per our capacity or capability, we can include it. Because it's not that I mean, the whole syllabus has to be completed and all the things. 
I mean, th that is what has been told to us by the state board. Yeah. And uh, whatever, but at the same time, you should keep it in mind exactly what you have said is correct 100% that if you want to teach a particular thing, first you should learn. Yeah. Uh, but then the, here, the generally, what uh, I have observed is that teachers want to do it and just for the namesake, they do it. They don't learn, learn themselves first. Yeah, that's so, because society, society expects them to simply focus. Correct. Teacher's job is getting students do well in examination. That's a job description. Yes, yes sir. And if parents get uh, annoyed with teachers, if they do something else, then of course teachers will not do that. And my experience has been that teachers are afraid to do something else because the parents will complain, the principal will complain, everybody else will complain. That is why we need support from the principal, the, admin, the, the management and the society and the parents. So if all of us come together to allow teachers to do something good, something good will happen. Otherwise, if it's an individual teacher, then you, you can do only a little bit. But even that teacher can do something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, quest, the, the issue that you're raising is actually, I think, what exactly do we need in order for students to do well in the examination? You don't need to cover the whole syllabus. You really don't, because a lot of things in the textbook and syllabus are irrelevant even for examination. Right, right, right. So if you look at the final examination questions or whichever examinations in which they have to do well, look at the examination questions, don't look at the textbook, don't look at the syllabus, it is irrelevant. And figure out what it is that the children need to learn in order to do well in those cases. So if there is no question on, for example, fabric in the final examination, well, you can skip fabric as a topic. Okay, why, why bother? So the teachers think that covering the portions in a textbook is important. That may not be the best way to even to teach them to do well. Actually, the coaching factories are the best cases. Fo coaching factories do this extremely well. They ignore everything else and train students to do it in examinations. <laughs> so hire the coaching factories to do that job and the teachers can do education. That is yeah, one yes. Even if... Even if the teachers uh, do not inculcate the critical thinking uh, in children, uh, if they allow the students to ask questions, that yeah. also will uh, will inculcate a sense of thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I've seen this happening in classrooms. the The teacher asks a question and expects an answer immediately. Yes, yes. The, the first student who answers the question is rewarded with "That's very good." <laughs> But there might be students who want to think. Thinking takes time. So if, if a learner, a slow thinker, who is actually a very good thinker, thinks for a moment, you know, two minutes, three minutes, over, that's, that student doesn't have an opportunity. So if teachers can wait, and if the first student says, I have the answer, you tell the student, wait, think first before you answer. And do not allow students to answer questions, you know, until they have thought about it for at least one minute or yes, two sir. minutes. Yeah, wait time. Wait time is important. Yeah. The, the student who answered the question immediately or even before the question is asked is not a thinking student. Don't encourage that student. So one of the things that we do is we ask a question and ask students to form groups and discuss the answer. And we wait. And we get one representative from each group to answer the question after about two minutes or three minutes. There is no competition then because there is collaboration in a peer group. The competitive spirit, I want to be the first person to answer, is eliminated by this, these pedagogical strategies, bus groups and stuff like that. And we have to do that systematically. Rewarding the first person to answer and not rewarding the slow thinker is very dangerous. Pallavi, ma'am, I think it's a Surendra. One, one Surendra, last Mr. question. Surendra. Um, um, Surendra. Surendra. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Last, question, last question, sir. Mr. Surendra, please go ahead with your question. Yes. Uh, Kirti Mohanan, sir. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you since one and a half hours. It means very interesting. All, everything, world is itself, it's a critical. Okay. So my question is, each and every child is unique, naturally. Then why we have forced them to learn the same syllabus, we is not digest is not ready to digest. That's the first question. And why means uh, syllabus completion is the education? That's two questions I have. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the first question. 
the, <laughs> the second question I have already answered the syllabus completion yeah, 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 I understand. is not yeah, necessary okay. for thinking. That is necessary okay. for examination. So sidestep that one. If you had oh. the other kind of uh, question, uh, curriculum, a curriculum <laughs> for education, developing the mind. If a child wants to have only potato chips and Coke, would you allow that child to do only that? Or would you say, no, that is not sufficient. You also need healthy food, various kinds of things, right? The, the education of the mind is the same type. It is not sufficient to have just one diet. You need to have various kinds of things in it. So if a child says, I don't want to learn arithmetic, you can give the freedom to learn arithmetic later, anytime, but before you complete your 10th grade, you must have arithmetic. Otherwise you'll be missing out on lots of things in your life. Yes. So there must be some clear sense of who an educated person is, what all students must learn, rudimentary stuff, basic stuff, by the time you complete your 10th grade education. And you might give the freedom to do it at different times. Maybe some students might uh, you know, do mathematics when they are like, let's say eight years old. And others would do it when they are 10 years old or 12 years old. That freedom can be given, but at the end, by the time they're finished with the 10th grade, they must all go through a basic program of education. What that means is every educated person should have an understanding of certain things should have certain abilities, the ability to reason, the ability to detect logical contradictions, the ability to engage with ethical questions and make decisions. These are part of an educated person's mind. And you cannot say no to it. Not the degree of competence. So not every student would want to learn, for example, let's say uh, calculus. And if calculus is not necessary for 10th grade, leave them alone. Leave it as a kind of special next option, specialization. If somebody wants to learn, uh, let us say, uh, uh, the specialize in Greek history, you don't force them to learn Greek history. So you have to distinguish between that which we expect of all educated people and specializations. And then give them the freedom to take different kinds of paths to get there to that 10th grade, uh, end of the 10th grade curriculum the education curriculum. In basic education is mandatory. Uh, yeah, but that is, that is the whole idea. I think humans, human children need education unlike let us say chimpanzee children. Even chimpanzee children are educated by their parents. Very true, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, this, sir. Uh, very wonderful, you know, I would say insight. Uh, things that we all knew, I mean, the way you started, I was like mushrooms, where is uh, what is going to come out? But uh, the very fact that you taught us today to think about the logical contradictions, have that critical eye, you know, for everything and rational temper. I think that is the most important, sir, because uh, the higher order cognitive abilities, I think we need to have our children question the most important things today. Uh, thank you so much, sir. A lot of takeaways. And I think uh, the chat box is saying it all. I don't need to say much more. Uh, indeed, a very beautiful, wonderful session. A lot of thought has gone in today. And I'm sure today uh, we are letting you go before 10, sir. But uh, <laughs> you. we are going to be busy <laughs> till 10, thinking about uh, <laughs> all yeah. the uh, things that we've questions, heard. If you have unanswered questions or if questions come up later, please contact me on email. I'll respond to you. Thank you and so you much, have sir. And email, email address in your uh, the, the uh, PDF file that you have downloaded. Yeah. Thank you so much. I request all the participants to uh, please fill up the feedback form. And uh, we all join together. Team CAR thanks you uh, from the bottom of our hearts, sir, for being with us today for this wonderful session. I also thank all our board of directors, our premium members, all the principals, teachers who have joined us today for this session. Thank you all. Thank you. One day, Gurum, to all present here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. One thank day. You. And thank you thank to you. Uh, Madam Tara and Aditi also for uh, helping out and making it such a smooth session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohan.
Vijay ma'am, you want to say something? You please no, today, you, say... you give the uh, closing uh, remark. <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Mohanan. Like what a uh, insightful session. Even I could understand. I keep telling Mohanan that half of his sessions I won't understand because I am, uh, you know, intellectually <laughs> challenged. I used to say. So today's session, even I could understand Mohanan. It was beautiful. Thank you so much for and, being uh, there, Tara. Saturday, same time. Uh, please uh, attend this also. This is also very important today. This artificial intelligence, how we know the teachers need to understand the same ID password can be used. Yeah. Yeah, proceed, ma'am. Sorry, because... <laughs> well, on 3rd of July. <laughs> and before that, on 29th of June. Thank yeah, you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, that, uh, that also I'll show you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think Mohan, your email ID is there on that PDF file, no? Because yeah, yeah. somebody has asked for yeah, your yeah. email ID. It's in I'm one PDF sure, file. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, friends, uh, I'm sure Mohan and Tara will be very happy to hear from you. You know, they are people who really want to reach out to schools and help. So please keep, uh, please write to him, write to the. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mohan, sir. Thank you, Pallavi, ma'am. Mahajan, sir. Suresh, sir. All, all, all. <laughs> Thank you, Guru. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. Good day, Pallavi. Good day, Guru.